Good evening and welcome. My name is Luke Speckman. This is my amazing wife, Brandon. We're honored to lead our New York City church as well as to oversee our churches in the Northeast US and in South Asia. We bring you warm greetings from New York City. As you can see, right behind us is the Midtown Manhattan skyline. In fact, you can see the Empire State Building just right there. And you know, New York City is a, a place where people come by the hundreds every single day with a vision and with a dream. They come here to uh, make it big in the arts, in finance, or in business. Uh, yet as disciples, we know and understand that we have willingly decided to lay down our worldly dreams and pick up and embrace God's dream for our lives. I'd like to start off with a scripture. Please turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. And uh, we know that in Acts chapter 2, um, Peter preaches a sermon as God initiates his kingdom here on earth, the Christian church. And Peter quotes the prophet Joel from Joel chapter 2, and he cites this occurrence as the fulfillment of this prophecy. He says in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women. You know, I'm sure that uh, many of us start off 2020 by writing out some goals and things we wanted to accomplish this year, and uh, all of us were sideswiped. Uh, 2020 did not go as planned. In fact, right now, the expectation was that we would all gather together, about 2,500 was the plan, in Los Angeles for a global leadership conference. And yet, because of the worldwide pandemic, COVID-19, we're unable to travel. And yet, God in His sovereignty has allowed us to have a virtual World Missions Jubilee instead. And so instead of just 2,500 being able to gather, literally every single disciple around the world can meet together. What an amazing providence of God. I'd like to turn it over to my wife. You know, as uh, my husband shared, people come from all over the world to make it big right here in New York City. And a lot of those include the women. You know, I think about some of our dreams that we had in the world. And if I think back and truly am honest, a lot of those dreams are just broken dreams. I had dreams to do these grandiose things. However, when I put down my worldly dreams and picked up God's dreams, oh, the peace that I have, the, the excitement that I now have. You know, I think about some of these dreams, you know, dreams to be pure, dreams for security. You know, I also think about dreams for my family to be saved. The things that I dream for now are so different than what I used to dream about when I was in the world. And so for the women out there, I'm really excited for you to be with us this weekend. It's going to be an exciting weekend full of vision and dreams. And so women, if you don't have a dream right now, my hope and prayer for you is that before this conference ends, you understand, one, who you are in God's kingdom, the vision and dreams that God has for you, and how, how are you going to live those dreams out. Thank you so much for joining us, and I do hope that you enjoy the entire conference. We do have a very exciting program for you. As you no doubt know, the title of our conference is Visions and dreams. And uh, we're kicking off our first general session right now. Tomorrow morning we'll have sessions by World Sector and then tomorrow evening we'll have a split men and women session. And then on Sunday, for the first time in history, we will have a virtual global worship service. And you don't want to miss it. It's going to be epic and amazing. You know, I would like to just offer a special thanks to Kip and Elena, as well as to Tim and Leanne for their hearts and their vision to continue and put on this virtual conference. I know it will be life-changing for every single person. And with that, we want to welcome you to the 2020, 2020 Virtual World, World Missions Jubilee. Jubilee. Let's go ahead and open up with a prayer. 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be gathered together virtually via the invisible continent, the internet. God, we thank you for the technology that you have allowed us to have to stay connected even though we are unable to travel. God, I do pray that uh, this conference would be life-changing for every single person, that everyone would come out with a vision and with a dream for their lives in your kingdom. God, we love you. We pray that you bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. My name is Raul, and this is my incredible wife, Linda, and we have the privilege of leading the Latin American world sector. And I really uh, want to thank Linda and I on behalf of the whole world sector for the special contribution. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all the sacrifice, the financial sacrifice, all the giving, which is bearing fruit in many people being saved all over the world. Just a little bit of, a little bit of good news from Sao Paulo. Our church in Sao Paulo has grown this year from 240 disciples to 283 disciples right now. God has done incredible things there. Also, the Rio church has grown from about 30 disciples to over 41, 42 disciples, I believe, at this point. God is doing amazing, amazing things. Linda's going to share for a little bit. Also, I wanted to uh, talk about how... We were so blessed um, to have the last missions conference in February before the pandemic broke out. Um, so I'm so grateful that we were able to have our missions conference called Open Your Eyes, where we sent out a church plant in Campinas. Uh, Luis and Malu were appointed um, evangelist and women's ministry leader. They've actually already been fruitful in Campinas, so that was amazing. Um, we had our third ICCM graduation with 11 graduates and our first fiber evangelist named which is Vinny that's incredible who's already an evangelist and now he's named a yes. cyber evangelist as well and all the churches are growing and they're doing really really well and very proud and excited about Carlos and Lucy in Mexico yes. Tulio and Vaitza are doing an amazing job in Bogota Colombia and Daniel and Carol are doing awesome in Lima, Peru. 
and Fran Alejandra are doing really great, awesome in uh, Santiago, Chile. And I also want to talk about Dani. She's one of our campus uh, students in USPI. So during the pandemic, during this COVID-19 craziness, she was able to baptize her mother, Lucia, and her grandfather, Osvaldo, and her grandmother, uh, Dangelira. So um, I'm just so grateful that even though we've been put all these barriers, God is still working and breaking through yeah. everything and helping us to be fruitful. It seems that God is really using this pandemic to really save family members. So, like Linda said, Danny Baptist, her grandparents and her mother. And I have personal good news. Uh, after 23 years of praying, my dear father, Raul Moreno Sr., he got baptized as an 81-year-old disciple. Thank you so much, Matt and Helen and the Miami Church uh, for taking care of him and loving him very much. We love you very much, uh, and we're excited to see what God will keep doing during this great year. Good evening, family from the Pac Rim World Sector. My name is Tim, this is my lovely wife, Leanne. And uh, I'd like to start us off here in Ephesians 3, verse 20. The Bible says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Well, guys, uh, my wife is going to share right now an incredible uh, missions victory, and then I have a little bit more good news for you. Well, greetings from the Pac Rim, but specifically LA. Um, my good news is the mission. So we had a, a goal of 1.3 million, and with everything that's been going on, the pandemic, between transitions, between sending out mission teams, the church here in LA was able to raise $1.4 million actually over $1.4 million. And I just want to say thank you so much to the LA Disciples for really pouring out your heart and being so generous to see the work of God happen through all the churches all around the world. So love you guys so much. That's my good news. Amen. You know, we're so grateful for our partnership with the Kazis, with the Chalinors, with the Dimitris. Uh, but I really want to share about the leadership in Los Angeles. We're so grateful for the four new super regions. Um, the first one is led by Artie and April Baker, who lead the All for One super region. Uh, the second one is the Revolution super region, led by uh, Brian and Joali Carr. The third one is the Alpha Omega super region, led by the McDonald's and the fourth one is the core super region led by the Gregory's. We are so grateful for these incredible partnerships in the gospel. So grateful for our congregational shepherds, the Antalans and the Kirshners. So grateful for uh, the Economos who lead our administration. And uh, of course, Rob Onakea, our lead cyber evangelist. Guys, God is doing incredible things in Los Angeles. We are set up for an incredible second half of the year. We're so grateful and we are so excited uh, that God has put us in a place where we are gonna, really going to be able to serve you more. We love you guys very much. Hi guys, my name is Michael Williamson and this is my incredible wife Michelle Williamson and we want to bring you some good news from the European world sector. You know, God is filling us with vision and dreams. It's been incredible. You know, our prime minister told us, hey, you can't baptize anybody. It's against the law. We've seen the coronavirus. And so there's been all these challenges, but despite the challenges, the overall growth for the entire European world sector has been 20%. So we now have over 250 sold out disciples in all of Europe. God is filling us with vision and dreams. And yes, he is. He's filling our campus ministry with visions and dreams in London. Out of that 20% growth, we've had a 65% growth just coming out of the campus ministry. Um, we've had some amazing young women, young men and women baptized. We had Abhishek, an Indian born. 
a master's student at Oxford Brooks who wants to now go into the full-time ministry. We had an incredible young woman, uh, half Chinese and half American, at the prestigious London School of Economics master's student there. She also wants to join us in the full-time ministry. And finally, on uh, Sunday, we had a great student from the uh, University in Edinburgh baptized. She's a med student at Victoria. She had to really fight for her faith and she had to move out of home in order to get baptized. What's incredible is she's going to be able to probably do her medical uh, schooling in London for at least a year until we plant the Edinburgh Church with the grades next year. We're really excited for that mission team. I'm also very excited about the Paris Church. As you know, Anthony and Cassidy, along with their shepherds Sandra and Kevin, all got coronavirus, and many of the disciples in the parish church also got corona. But in spite of all that, their church grew by 30% and are also experiencing much growth in the campus ministry. God is moving in a powerful way. In a singles ministry, we saw a Hollywood costume designer. She got baptized. We went out on the street preach. She heard it and she got baptized. We seen a, a, a music producer, Franklin, an acclaimed music producer, awesome guy. He got baptized, we're now producing music. And then his wife, who's a BBC presenter, she got baptized and just named some of the incredible baptisms God has done uh, this year in the church. You know, and uh, of course, we're so incredibly uh, inspired to plant churches. So we, we, we raise our missions contribution every year, but this year was really special because with a goal of raising 118,000, we were able to blow it out 122,000 US dollars. So next year, we're gonna plant Scotland, we're going to be planning Portugal, and we're going to be planning several other churches. We love you so much. We're filled with dreams and visions. To God be all the glory. I bring you greetings from the mighty Metro Miami Church and the SAGES World Sector. SAGES stands for South Asia. Gulf, Caribbean, and much of the Eastern Seaboard. In South Asia, God is doing an incredible work. Very soon, prayerfully in November, we'll be planting the church in Kolkata, India. And then, if that's not enough, early next year, we're hoping to plant the church in Colombo, Sri Lanka. I'm so excited to be able to share three great stories from, with you from the Sages World Sector. We're gonna start with the New York City Church. Our sister Shivanti, unfortunately, contracted the COVID virus. She was hospitalized for 90 days, and 60 of those days she was on a ventilator. Well, Luke and Brandon Speckman called the whole church to fast and pray together on June 22nd and June 23rd, and many disciples around the world joined in. And at the end of the fast on June 23rd, Shivanti came off the ventilator for the very first time. And now she's out of the hospital, home and healthy with her husband, Travis. Let's move down further south to the Miami church. Brianna Blake met a wonderful young woman, Avita Lewis. Avita was dating a young man, Damien Party. She broke up because she wanted to study the Bible and seek God with all her heart. Well, Damien also chose to seek God with all his heart. They both got baptized on July 18th, 2018. Since that day, Damien's converted 10 of his friends and family in the last year and a half. What an incredible example. Avita reached out to her younger brother, who was a teen, Gio. He got baptized this past October, and in the last six months, he's converted three of his friends. In Orlando, we had an incredible young woman, Deborah, get baptized from the UCF Campus Ministry back before we sent the mission team to Miami. She came with us on the mission team. Since she's been on the mission team, she went into the ministry last July. She got married to Isaac Gonzalez, in November of last year. They started leading a sector together, the WAVE sector, which started with five disciples and now is 21 amazing campus students. And today, Deborah Gonzalez's mother, Monse Bueno, is getting baptized in the Orlando church. And finally, I want to tell you a quick story about a dear family who's become very close to us. That's Ron and Tracy Harding, who oversee the work in Atlanta. Ron and Tracy also oversee all of the work from around the world on the internet. While going through this, the COVID thing, uh, Ron has done an incredible job continuing to study for his master's degree for the ICCM. 
while he was doing this, he got a little bit sick and then decided to turn the church over to Mike and Stephanie Schaefer, who are training to be sent out very soon. They've done an incredible job. The church continues to grow. And Lord willing, Ron will finish his master's degree and we will have ICCM Atlanta. That is good news from the Sages World Sector. Hey everyone, my name is Oleg Sirotkin and this is my beautiful wife, Aliona. We have a lot of great news from all Eurasia. Right now we are uh, witness of great celebration uh, in Odessa and we want to start from uh, good news from Kiev because God want to make a lot of miracles in the moment in this year so first good news god bless our church in kiev last year as you know we moved from moscow to kiev to rebuild new church because alona was blocked uh, by a russian border and we start to lead church in kiev it was tremendous anyway uh having a bad news on the past, God bless us, only last few months by pandemia, time 27 edition only in Kyiv and now we have a lot of, a lot of good news, people love each other, so I want to give a, a chance to share my wife about waiting, yeah, you can start it. Yeah, we're a family. And we're so happy to see how people fall in love with each other. Uh, we had uh, only for six months, last six months, in uh, our small church, four weddings. So we expect the right. next one in September. Today we are witnessing an uh, amazing place of Black Sea in the south of Ukraine. Uh, an amazing wedding of Gustavo and Anna. Very close friends of Sofia and Luca, who was just married one year ago. Go. International yes, couple. Oh, international couple. Exactly. Yeah. So now we have a lot of international couples uh, in Moscow. Uh, Lira and uh, Arvi. That's then, right. Uh, Belarusia and Russia. Uh, Masha. Masha and Vlad. Matviyuk. Then, uh, of course, Sofia and Luca. Now, Gustavo and Anya. And Slava and Ola. We just was one week ago. We were witnesses of amazing wedding. That's right. Yeah. It was tremendous. So, uh, God loves families. God loves weddings. And um, God is love. Yeah. Exactly. So, we are praying God will multiply us. And good news. Because Slava and Olga in Kharkov was married, we have amazing new beginning Bible talk in the Kharkov church, remnant group. So pray for us, please. It's amazing to be with you. I have past GLC ever we had before. Love you so much. Let's multiply the word. Amen. Greetings from the Middle East and Southwest family of churches. I'm Corey Blackwell, and this is my wife, Geraldine, and together we lead the Middle East World Sector. Buen días a todos, especialmente mi hermanos y hermanas latinas, latinos, gracias por estar con nosotros hoy. You know, God told Joshua after the death of Moses that he was to lead the Israelites into the Promised Land. He said in Joshua 1, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I shall never forsake you nor leave you. Certainly God is with us and he keeps his promise. I remember when we went to Dubai to spy out the land in 2016 with R.D. and April Baker and a young lady named Dale Henderson. And we went up on top of this hotel and we stepped our foot down and we prayed with all of our heart that God would give us uh, a church there in Dubai, which would become a Crown of Thorns church. 
Well, later on, God did just that as R.D. and April valiantly planted the church there in Dubai, and it grew courageously. Well, now the church is led by our son and daughter in the faith, Miguel and Savvy Mendez, and they've been a powerful force of faith throughout all of the Middle East, actually. Um, they had a goal, and they called it the Road to 100. We wanted to see 100 baptisms. Well, they've completed that goal, and now it is on to 200, the Road to 200 baptisms in Dubai, the Middle East. Is that not outstanding? Geographically, the Middle East is comprised of Dubai, as I just said, led by Miguel and Savvy. And there's four other states in the United States that make up the, the Southwest. In Arizona, we have two churches. Well, first there's Phoenix, and that is led by Jeremy and Amy Chiramella. And then we're just planting Tucson, and then that's led by Scott and Sandy London. We're so fired up at what's going to happen there in Tucson. And then we move on to Albuquerque, Another son and daughter in the faith, Marcus and Heather Cameron, lead the church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Over in Las Vegas, Nevada, Las Vegas, we have Princeton and Joy George. We're so fortunate to have these valiant, valiant women's uh, evangelists and women's ministry leaders to be side by side with us in the gospel. Geraldine and I, we now reside in San Diego, California. And alongside of us, our partners in the gospel in this great region of the world, is Danny and Patty Granger. Together we will lead the, the San Diego church family, and they will oversee, the Grangers will oversee the planting of Tijuana, Mexico. Imagine that, the Middle East and Mexico. God is truly amazing. We would like to take the time to thank Kip and Elena McKean for giving us this opportunity to serve this part of the kingdom. Because of your love and faith, many will be saved. We are also thankful to be part of a true kingdom family. Your generosity through missions and disciples you have sent us has given us the resources to take the gospel to the great Holy Land. We would like to especially thank the following churches for sending their precious disciples to the Middle, the middle East field. John and Emma Kazi of Chicago, Carlos and Lucy Mejia de la Ciudad de Mexico, <laughs> Preston and Shauna Inkley of Portland, Oregon, Colton and Mandy Roan of Columbus, Ohio, Jeremiah and Julie Clark of Indianapolis, Indiana, Barb and Jay Shelbrack of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Tim and Leanne Kernan of Los Angeles, California, Richard and Hannah Hardy of Eugene, Portland. What an amazing, we are so appreciative of all your generosity for each and every one of us. And we do believe this, as God told Joshua that he would give them that land, we believe that God is speaking to us today. So in the name of Christ, we have claimed the Holy Land and we know everywhere that we step our foot, God will give to us, give to the kingdom of God this promised land. So thank you for all your love, all your support, all the missions, all the people, and everything we as a kingdom-wide family have done that will see the Holy Land evangelized in our day. God bless you. Greetings from the Austral China World Sector. My name is Joe Willis and my beautiful wife, Kerry Willis. We'd love to share with you some highlights of this year so far. We had our very first baptism in Crouching Tiger 2, which is super exciting. Um, since this time last year, the church in Apia, Samoa has doubled with five family members being baptized. When we were all shut down in COVID-19 as a world sector, all the five churches got together in the month of May and had a 24 hour a month long prayer and fasting chain so everybody was praying into church as a result of that i believe god heard our prayers and in june when we came out of lockdown for a lot of us we had our best month of baptisms around the world sector even here in sydney in seven weeks we had nine people baptized and one of those amazing baptisms was a, a credible young lady from Queensland named Chantel. She was met online by one of the brothers in the San Francisco church and her number was passed on to Megan Lowheed who is here in Sydney. Megan studied the Bible with her over Zoom for a couple of months and when the COVID-19 restrictions were lifted, she actually flew down from Queensland 
finished studying the Bible, made the decision to stay here and got baptized a week later. You know, some of our churches are now out of the COVID-19 restrictions, Samoa and Auckland. And just a couple of weeks ago, Auckland had an international day, which was a push service, and 19 Christians brought 53 friends out to church. Great job, Auckland. God seems to be doing incredible things for the islands. In the last couple of weeks, we've had a, a brother, two brothers baptized, one from Fiji and one from Tonga. And we've had some incredible young Chinese students baptized this year as well. So I know a lot of you have been praying for us. Continue your prayers, please, because we feel them so that we can forcefully advance our churches in the Austral Church, uh, China world sector. Thanks a lot. Salbona! Greetings from the Africanist World Sector and the Rainbow Nation of South Africa. Family, we hope this message finds you well as we all continue to deal with the challenges of COVID-19. Despite internet difficulties here in the third world and increased lockdown restrictions, God continues to add to our number. We're so proud of our Kinshasa DRC Democratic Republic of Congo church leaders, Mickey and Lillian Gungu, as we've seen 17 souls be added to the Kinshasa church in the past two weeks. The Kinshasa church has grown from 386 to 403 disciples, and now there are 546 disciples across the DRC. God is also blessing our efforts here in South Africa as we're approaching our one year anniversary in September. Since arriving, our 11 member mission team has almost tripled as we baptize teens, campus students, singles, and also married. You know, we're also excited to start a signature Mercy Worldwide project here in South Africa. We are currently in discussions to adopt a primary school in Soweto. Amen. This past June was also exciting as we celebrated the fourth anniversary of the mighty Lagos Church, now led by our dear friends Balaji and Shinir Yakin Fenwa. They're praying to reach 200 soul out disciples by the end of this year and be praying for God to use the Lagos Church to help plant the Accra Ghana Church in 2022. Our first Mercy Signature Project at The Real School in Lagos has grown from 40 students to now over 100 students and we built a second school for the primary students in the indigent area of Okobaba. It's also encouraging to see that God is blessing the arts, media, and sports ministry here in Johannesburg. This year, we baptized a sister named Dee Dee. She's an actress. She also reached out to her brother Bo Kang and he became a disciple. Dee Dee has acted in four movies. She's also a teen presenter on one of the popular youth TV shows here in South Africa called Yo TV. And she's also currently acting in a soap opera. We're so proud of her. We're also proud of the Washington DC church. In the last two months, they've added 22 souls. That is so incredible. We're so grateful for them. Amen. We're also very proud of Amadou and Angel Santora, the leaders of our great Abidjan Ivory Coast Church, as they started two remnant groups this year. Earlier in March, they were stranded due to COVID issues for about two months in the Republic of Benin. But while they were there, the Lord used them to baptize 15 campus students at the best university in the country. And they were also able to pull in an ICOC ministry couple and shepherding couple seeking revival. Then a month later, the Santoras went to Bujumbura, Burundi, where they baptized 80 souls in two weeks of studying. We now have 13 remnant groups across the continent of Africa. We're so excited to be able to welcome Blaise and Patricia Fumba, who are moving to Abidjan this year to oversee the work for French-speaking Africa. Please pray for the work in East Africa as God is calling out the remnant from the ICOC. God willing, Osas and Ariel Atohengbe will plant the Pillar Church for East Africa in Nairobi, Kenya in 2023. Amen. I'm also encouraged to announce the very first virtual Women's Day in the Johannesburg Church. It will be August 22nd and the theme is worthy. Sonia Kopek is going to be our guest speaker. That is so special because Sonia is a native of South Africa. We're so grateful to have her. Amen. The Lord continues to do incredible miracles here in Africa on behalf of the 1,500 souls across the motherland. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your financial support. We love you.
captives came back into Zion from their freedom came a scheme while the city Greetings from Los Angeles from Elena and me on August 7th, the first night of the historic Virtual World Missions Jubilee. Consider for a moment that originally planned on these days was the Global Leadership Conference where maybe 2,500 disciples would gather, mostly from America because it was cost prohibitive and there were visa challenges for, for people outside the United States. And yet because of the coronavirus, we were forced by God 
to go virtual and are now able to bring the World Missions Jubilee to not only the 7,500 disciples of the sold out movement, but to their over thousands of friends and family and to our dear remnant brothers and sisters all around the world. The title for my lesson comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3. Not many visions in those days. I think to appreciate the darkness of the hour, we need a bit of an historical overview of some of the dates that precede and also go after this text. In 1446 BC, with the 10 plagues of Egypt and Moses leading the people on the Exodus. In 1406 BC, Moses dies and Joshua becomes the central leader of God's people. In 1399 BC, the promised land is divided between the 12 tribes of Israel. In 1375 BC, Joshua bids them farewell and dies. And now begins the period of the judges, a period of darkness for about 250 years. The 12 tribes become largely autonomous. As a matter of fact, there are even times they become enemies and kill each other. They are dominated by a succession of pagan peoples, the Moabites, the Canaanites, the Midianites, the Amorites, and the Philistines. In the book of Judges, we see that the people of God fall into idolatry that causes them to even intermarry with these godless people. As a matter of fact, in the tribe of Benjamin, a whole city is given over to homosexuality. Now, it's during the latter part of the book of Judges, during the Philistine domination of Israel, in about 1100 BC, that Samuel is born. Now, Eli is the main prophet, or dare we say, judge at this time. And yet, also at this time, is Samson. And so we remember in the scriptures that Samson was to begin the freedom of Israel from the Philistines. Of course, we understand that he dies, uh, uh, in some ways, a valiant death. And that's in about 1075 B.C. Then, in 1170, Israel is routed by the Philistines, so much so that Eli dies, his two sons dies, the ark of God is captured, and it is said of that moment, the glory has departed from Israel. And so the ark goes with the Philistines, signifying that God was no longer with his people. In about 1050 BC, we find that Samuel rises on up, inspires all Israel, and leads them to victory at Mizpah. And a few years later, in 1043 BC, Saul becomes king. In about 1024 BC, David, about 16 years old, is anointed by Samuel. And then in 1010, Saul dies, David becomes king of Judah. And in 1003, David becomes king of all Israel and Judah. Now, getting back to our text, let us remember that Hannah was barren, and through prayer, God gives her a son that she names Samuel. She dedicates him to the Lord, and so she gives him to Eli when he was about three years old. But the text picks up in chapter 3, 1 Samuel, when he was a young boy, an apprentice, dare we say, of Eli. And he was training to become a priest. He was of the tribe of Levi. And we find right here that Josephus and the Jewish rabbis say that Samuel is 12 years old. Let's begin to read our text. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord and Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. Now let's stop right there. We find that the King James Version says the word of God was precious. It was rare in those days. It was such a great darkness. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the leader of God's people, Eli, his physical eyes were weak and they could barely see. And of course, they're paralleling it to his spiritual eyesight. That in fact, the leader of God's people, his vision was weak. Now, very interestingly, we read on in verse 3, it says, 
The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. You know, it's amazing. In the darkest of times, the lamp of God may flicker, but it never goes out. There's always hope for God's people. Now let's read on. Verse 4. Then the Lord called to Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, "I I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in that place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, Speak. For your servant is listening. You know, I've read this passage many times. And yet there's a little detail that just jumped out at me in verse 3. It says that Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord. We understand this is a tabernacle, but it says where the ark of God was. And I guess I'd always envisioned that when he heard this voice, it just kind of appeared. But we need to understand that in Numbers 789, the Bible tells us that when Moses had built the ark of God, that God spoke between the two cherubim that were on top of the ark. That's where his voice came out. And so here was Samuel. He was lying down by that very ark. And it's from the ark that God now speaks to Samuel. He had been silent for hundreds of years. And so when he hears the voice, at first he rushes to Eli, but Eli didn't call. This happened a couple of times. But then finally, Eli goes, the ark, God, is speaking to you. Simply say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now, we understand this was a very, very dark time. You know, in time, Samuel changes Israel and provides a path for the righteous leadership of David. Likewise, hundreds of years later, Jesus changed Israel, fulfilling the prophecy that a great light had dawned. And you know, in the darkness of 2003, after the collapse of the International Churches of Christ, we find that the Holy Spirit took Elena and myself, quite hurty and quite crippled, to Portland, Oregon. And you may ask, well, why Portland, Oregon, of all places? Well, we need to understand what an old preacher once preached. Where it's darkest, the light shines brightest. You see, the Portland ICOC, six months earlier before our arrival, was 300 disciples. By the time we get there, they were scattered. As a matter of fact, at our first midweek in July of 2003, One of the brothers came to help me set up the chairs. His name's Guy Hobbs. And I said, Guy, do you think we should set up 20 or 25 chairs? And he paused. He goes, you know, brother, I think you need to have faith. Let's set up 25. And you know something? We had 25 people come for our first worship service that Wednesday night. Now, you know, we were hurting. And yet... One of the things that we came out of is that we, we understood that there was a great darkness that had fallen upon the ICOC. You see, just two months earlier, Lane and I had been fired over what we now call the five core convictions of the sold-out movement. Number one, we're a Bible church, not just a New Testament church. Number two, we speak where the Bible is silent. And we're silent. We just shut up where the Bible speaks, just obey it. We believe that discipling is a command. We believe in central leadership. And we believe in the evangelization of the nations in this generation. That's why we were, we were fired. And so we went to Portland quite humbled 
And yet we still believed in these convictions. Amazingly, in short order, the Portland church in the next three years became the fastest growing church in all of the ICOC. You see, we went back to Portland not to start a new movement. We went back there to try to change the ICOC from the inside. And yet, after being there a couple of years, we were disfellowshipped. We were cast out because of these same core convictions. You know, by 2006, it was evident that God was forging a new movement. And I knew that if we we're going to start something, we needed to go to a much bigger city than Portland. And so the Lord put upon Elena's in my heart to go back to Los Angeles. And so on May 6, 2007, 42 sold out disciples from Portland planted what is now known as the City of Angels International Christian Church. We had 324 in attendance that inaugural service. And you may say, but, but why Los Angeles? Well, you see, where it's darkest, the light shines brightest. Very interesting to me, and I didn't know this at the time, but there is an interesting parallel. Jesus was in Galilee for three years, but he knew that's not where they could start the movement, where he'd start the kingdom. The kingdom would start in the biggest city in Israel, Jerusalem. The same with us. We were there in Portland for about three years, but we knew that to start the new movement, we needed to get to the biggest city possible, Los Angeles. You know, amazingly, just two years later, the Lord put upon my heart what's now known as the Crown of Thorns Project. Of course, it comes from Jesus' vision of Acts 1.8. And in everything in the sold out movement, we try to emulate the heart and the vision of Jesus. And some of his last words, the apostles, before he ascended to heaven, he says, I want you to go and take the word to Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so we have that same parallel in the Crown of Thorns project. Jerusalem, well, that's Los Angeles. Judea and Samaria, that's US and Canada. The ends of the earth, ah, they're still the ends of the earth. But under the ends of the earth, we have a phase one. And phase one is we targeted arguably the 12 most influential cities outside of the United States. At that time, only one of them had a sold out movement ministry, and that was Santiago, Chile. You know, in the meantime, in 2014, we appointed for the first time world sector leaders. A little bit later, we appointed what we called the Crown of Thorns Council, which is the 70. So Jesus had the 12 that represented, of course, the starting of a new kingdom. And the 70 represented the concept of going to all nations because to the Jews, in Genesis chapter 10, there were 70 nations. And so emulating Jesus, we had a parallel to the apostles, the world sector leaders, and a parallel to the 70 apostles of Luke 10, the Crown of Thorns Council. Amazingly, by 2017, all 12 of these cities in the first phase of the Crown of Thorns Council project had been planted by the Lord. You know, amazingly, today, August 7th, 2020, those 42 Portland disciples have been multiplied by the Spirit into 7,500 disciples in over 100 churches in 46 nations on all six populated continents of the world. Understand this. This is not a movement of men. It is the very movement of God. You know, we remember that after God spoke to Samuel third time, he uttered the words that I think we should speak. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And I considered, well, what is God saying to us today? There's some very interesting scriptures in the last book of the Bible, in Revelation. In chapters 2 and 3, Jesus speaks to the seven churches of Asia. Now, after each one of these addresses, there's a little line that says, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now understand, there's a greater message than just to those seven churches in the Roman province of Asia. Seven means complete, perfect. So in the scriptures, not only was that address meant for all the churches 
in the first century, but for all the churches of all time, which includes us. So what is God saying to us? Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation 2, Jesus addresses the first church in Ephesus, and he says in verse 4, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you fall. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Our first point is very simply this. Be faithful to your first love. You know, I, I still remember being baptized April 11th, 1972 at 1.30 in the morning. Now, there are only four people at my baptism, so I guess they weren't expecting much. But I was so fired up to be baptized in Christ, to know the truth, to quote-unquote have a first love for Jesus. And you know, a short time after that, about a year later, I met a young lady named Elena Garcia Bengochea. I still remember going out on my very first date. I mean, I, I fell in love with her the, that very first date. Now, I, it was a little shaky. We went to uh, University of Florida football game, and then afterwards we went to an Italian restaurant. Now, it's kind of an Italian restaurant. You didn't sit down exactly. You had to move a tray across right there. And I was trying to impress her. I was trying to share. And as you can see, I talk a lot with my hands. And in the midst of going through the line, I had my salad and I was talking. All of a sudden, I just hit my salad bowl and it just flies away. Elena was very gracious. She didn't say much. She says, well, I really appreciate that story. That was very nice. Well, um, it was great. We went out on a few more dates. And interestingly enough, uh, my mom came into town and I wanted my mom to meet Elena. Now, we weren't dating. But I remember after meeting, mom said, is that the one? I go, mom, I think she is. And you know, all of you that are dating or, or perhaps uh, engaged, you know how, it also, how awesome it is to receive a letter from the person you took out on a date, a thank you note. And I would get thank you notes from Elena almost every time. And I wouldn't just read it once. I'd read them over and over again. We well, you know in a very real way, this is like our first love for Christ. When, when we're baptized, we're so fired up. We're so enthusiastic. I mean, we, we can't wait to spend time with them. We can't wait to read that letter, the Word of God, the Bible, over and over again. We can't wait to introduce our first love to all those that we love. So I've got a question for you. Are you as fired up now as the day you were baptized when you had your first love? If not, like Jesus says right here, you need to repent. You know, I can honestly share that after 48 years of being a disciple, I am more fired up now than ever before. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. There's a message here from Jesus that I, I think is a message we need in this coronavirus pandemic era. He starts off in verse 18. He says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and is incomparably great power for us to believe. That power is like the work of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms. He says, I want you to open your eyes. I want you to understand how incredible it is to be a disciple, how incredible the kingdom of God is, how incredible the power that lies within you, the Holy Spirit. He says, it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. But look at the key verse, verse 22. And God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. You know, some people have mistaken this scripture for Colossians 1.18, which says that Christ is the head of the body, and he is. 
But that's not what this passage says. It says that Christ has everything under his feet for the sake of the church. And that includes the coronavirus. The coronavirus, though destructively used by Satan, is under the authority of Jesus Christ for the sake of the church. Consider this. Globally, it's recorded that over 6 million people have had the coronavirus. Over 650,000 have died. In the U.S. alone, over 4 million have had the coronavirus. And about one-fourth of all the deaths of the world have happened in the United States, about 150,000. For several months, many of us in the United States were stopped from working, and there was no income, and yet we had the missions contribution coming. I was concerned because I didn't want anybody on the mission field let go because the United States didn't provide funding. Amazingly, God answered our prayers in an amazing way with stimulus checks as well as PPP, small business loans to churches. And to show the kind of heart that I believe that all the U.S. disciples have for the international missions, we had a goal of $2.9 million. God, through your sacrifice, gave us $3.9 million. God is on the move. You know, I believe that one of the great things of this hour is that people are more open in every nation than ever before in our lifetime. And so what is the message that we as disciples, that we as God's church should preach? Number one, the church should offer a message of a very big God. You know, often Elena and I go for a prayer walk every morning and one of the things I like to do is to open up our prayer and a, with a sense of praise, praising God for the creation of the universe, or some people think the multiverse, and all the order and the glory and the color and the grandeur. But as some of you know, I'm a chemistry major, so I marvel not only in the micro, in the macro universe, but also in the micro universe, to understand how all of the protons and neutrons and electrons all fit together to perfectly build every element in our solar system. You know, if God is a God of the universe, the macro universe and the micro universe, he is a big God and he's a lot bigger than any problem you may have or any problem that your friends have. He is the answer. You know, our message should also be one that we have a firm foundation. You know, so many people feel that they have no control, which is true, but they never had control. They just thought they did. But in Christ, we have the firm foundation of Jesus as the rock of our lives. You know, I think it's very interesting that the virus has no borders, no borders to age, no border to sex, no border to race, no border to nations. And yet as a church, we've got a great message. God's church, God's family has no borders. We are one in Jesus Christ. You know, I hear, at least I read on USA Today or CNN, that a lot of people are sitting at home doing nothing, bored, playing video games. They're, quote, having no fun. But you know, as a church, we have a message. The message is this, that in Christ we have a purpose. Our purpose is is to individually change people's lives to the message of Jesus. And so collectively, we can change the world. I don't know about you. I'm busier than ever with all of my phone calls. And finally, people are literally scared to death. But you know, the church, we offer a great message of eternal life. You know, amazingly, there are probably about 100 disciples that have had the COVID-19. And interestingly, very similar to the passage in Exodus, I believe, chapter 10, where there was a clear distinction between the darkness of the Egyptians and the light of the Israelites. To my knowledge, not one single disciple has died. God is protecting his people, and he's making it clear that where it's darkest, the light 
shines brightest. You know, more open than ever, I can't help but think of our brothers and sisters in Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. You know, just last week, they smashed the 400 disciple barrier. They have 405 disciples there now. And in the nation of the DRC, there are almost 600 disciples. Last Sunday in Brazil, there were nine baptisms, five in Sao Paulo, four in Rio. And Rio is a church of only 40 disciples. And amazingly, their evangelist, Raul Moreno, in June, baptized his dad. In India, in the last two weeks, there have been 15 baptisms in the last 14 days. And amazingly, in Chicago, they started January 1 with 131 disciples. And through a supplemental mission team and a ton of baptisms, they now have 225 disciples. They have grown by 94 disciples this year in seven months. 23 of those are campus baptisms. God is moving in a great way. You know, I was talking to a remnant disciple, and I was sharing about the church plantings and the extraordinary growth and the remnant groups have come out in new nations like Benin and Burundi and Japan and Thailand. And he was surprised we were still planting churches. And I said to him, I said, the kingdom of God most forcefully advanced not only the kingdom, but every disciple. You know, growing up, I had two heroes before Jesus. One was John F. Kennedy and the other was Martin Luther King. John F. Kennedy was killed and martyred when I was in fourth grade. And Martin Luther King was killed and martyred when I was in ninth grade. Both were morally flawed, but they died for their dream. And I love the quote from Martin Luther King right before the Montgomery March in 1965. It's 54 miles. He says, some people are saying we need to slow down and cool off. Well, I say we done cooled off too long. You know, you can cool off so much sometimes that you end up in a deep freeze. My question to you during this COVID pandemic, is your heart in a deep freeze? Have you lost your first love? It's time now to repent and shine brighter than you ever have before. Let's get back to Revelation chapter 2 for our second point. We find... He now addresses the church in Smyrna. And we read in verse 10. Jesus says, Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you'll suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. My second charge, be faithful in suffering. These were the words of Jesus. It's a dark hour when the book of Revelation was being written. It was written about 40, 95 AD during the persecution of Domitian. And we understand that Satan uses suffering to weaken disciples' convictions. As a matter of fact, not just weaken our convictions, but to divide us from one another, to divide nation from nation. Culture from culture, race from race, brother from brother, and even men from women. Now, biblically, we understand that suffering tests us. There's an awesome book that just came out. It's by my dear son in the faith, Andrew Smelly, who's the world sector leader of Africa. And uh, this was his doctoral thesis. And it's simply entitled Proven Genuine. An examination of suffering in the book of Job. I highly recommend you read it. it is, it's a thrilling book. It's a challenging book. I know I was really encouraged by it. You know, in America, I think that we were all stunned on May 25th at the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He was an unarmed African-American man who was arrested by a Caucasian police officer who kneeled on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, two minutes and 53 seconds, he was unresponsive and he died. You know, at the time I was 
very saddening. And I did see many brothers and sisters come out on Facebook, African-American brothers and sisters, and they were deeply wounded, deeply hurt by this ungodly police brutality. But for five days, I did not share anything on Facebook or any other media, thinking that, well, people understand how I feel. But I really want to apologize to my African-American brothers and sisters for being silent for five days. In time, a sister wrote to me, and I wrote her back, and I wrote another one back the next day, so much so that the next day on May 31st, I, I wrote a general letter to all of the evangelists around the world, but particularly to the USA lead evangelists. And I, and I shared my heart with them. I said, right now, there's the movement Black Lives Matter. And different people have different feelings about it, but we need to get a conviction here. And I, I, I want to address particularly the white leaders. I said, I think what our brothers and sisters are saying is, hey, yeah, all lives matter to us. Yeah, we want to evangelize the nations, but we need to hear from you that black lives matter. And when we hear that black lives matter to you, then yes, we can say all lives matter. You know, I wrote as well to them, and I said, you know something, don't try to say you can relate, if you're white, to the trials that the African Americans have been through. I mean, no way you're worried about your kid when you let them out of the house to play that someone's going to do something bad to them. I said, instead, with the black brothers and sisters, you, you need to seek to understand their backgrounds, their pain, and then minister to them with the word of God. You know, it's interesting how Satan tries to take advantage of divides that can come even in the church. And so right at this time, there was a rumor that came to me from one of the churches on the East Coast. And a couple of brothers called me and they said, hey, bro, a black couple was fired from the full-time ministry, but if they'd have been white, they wouldn't have been fired. I said, I don't believe that, but you know something? I'm going to investigate. I'm going to get down to it. So I talked to this couple, spent an hour on the phone with the guy and an hour with her. Then I talked to particular church leaders. And praise God, I was able to come back and say, no, 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 <laughs> that was not the case. Absolutely not were they taken out for that reason. And I've got to gently warn you as a brother and as an evangelist that you cannot make these undocumented charges against the Lord and against his leadership. Praise God, everybody has repented. You know, we need to understand that the church, God's church, the sold out movement, is not to be used as a civil rights organization. Now, I think sometimes where brothers and sisters get a little cloudy right here is that there are great heroes like Martin Luther King, who was a Baptist minister. And so, in a sense, they kind of get the idea that the church is a civil rights organization. No, 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 no. God's church needs to be a civil rights example. We need to emulate the kind of teaching that all men and women are created equal in the church. Now, bottom line, what did Jesus say? Did he say to go out and protest? Did he say to go out and be forceful? No, no, no. He says, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to left. We need to understand that our goal is not to ostracize different groups, either inside the church or outside the church. Our goal is to let them see that we are different, that we are a great light in this lost world. You know, I hope and pray that anybody that feels like they want to talk about some of the issues in the church, feel free to call me, text me, email me. I'd love to talk. I want to hear your heart out. But my appeal is this. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Paul writes, <clears throat> verse 26, You're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who are baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourself with Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are one in Christ Jesus. You belong to Christ. 
Then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Here, there's no Jew or Greek. There's no black or white. There's no Asian or Hispanic. But we are one and we are equal heirs in Christ. This is the glory of the church. You know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, my last good news email, I, I wrote the fact that, hey, as a disciple, I'm colorblind. Well, <laughs> I got a letter from one of the sisters. And she says, well, I, I trust your heart. I think I know what you're saying. But that offended me. And she says, it offended me because I'm very proud to be black and I'm very proud to be a woman. So I wrote her back. I said, sis, I will never use that terminology again. You're right. It is very awesome that you're black, I'm white, and we can be united. That you're a female, I'm a male, and you're right. We can be united. That is the glory, that we are different, and yet we are one in Christ. Now, let me say this. As difficult as race relations are in America, I think there's a greater challenge to us as a fellowship. I think the fellowship challenge lies between nations and nations. Right now, with this COVID pandemic, nations lining up against nations, particularly the whole dilemma with the superpowers, Russia, China, America. But we need to understand that we, our primary citizenship is in heaven. You know, I, I love going to Kiev, Ukraine, but Ukraine is this nation that's kind of trapped between Russia and trapped between the West, America. And yet when I go there, it's, it's so awesome because when I look around the fellowship, I don't see a Russian Christian or Ukrainian Christian or an American Christian. I see all of us united as global disciples of Jesus in one family. Same is true when I go to Johannesburg. I mean, very interestingly, when the mission team got there, they were largely rejected. Why? Because South Africa's prejudice? Well, I'm sure there's some, but that's not the issue. Right now, there's what's called xenophobia in South Africa, particularly in Johannesburg. And xenophobia is described as the fear or hate of foreigners. Now, what do you think a mission team is? It's a bunch of foreigners coming into a nation to evangelize it. And the primary people they hate are Nigerians. Well, guess what the largest segment of our mission team was? <laughs> Nigerians and Americans. And yet, when we went to the inaugural service, it was a beautiful thing again to see. I didn't see Nigerian Christians or American Christians or South African Christians, I saw global disciples united in one family. You know, I hope and pray that all of us can be excited. I mean, I, I think it's thrilling to think that without planning, the Minneapolis mission team is officially being sent out here at the World Missions Jubilee. I mean, Think about it. No one thought about Minneapolis, Minnesota until May 25th, and now God had planned beforehand that he was going to send a great light that would dawn in that city. God is moving amongst the nations. Lastly, let's get back to the book of Revelation for our last point. Let's let Jesus talk to us one more time here. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. These are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. That's the word of God. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. I bet a lot of us feel that's where we live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. You know, the word witness in the Greek is martyr. To be a witness for Jesus Christ, which we're all called to be, is to be willing to die for the cause. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And in Revelation 2, verse 6, it says Jesus hates the teachings of the Nicolaitans. We need to be faithful to the truth. You know, we live in a time when... Christianity seems blurred, and yet the Bible is crystal clear about what the truth is. We live in a time where there's a blur about what it means to be saved. Some say just be baptized as a baby. Some say just be baptized because it's in the Bible, just as a command of God. Some say, hey, 
If you live a good moral life, you'll be saved. But the Bible says that you have to repent. You have to turn away from the darkness. You have to turn to light and become a disciple. And then and only then you're baptized for the remission of your sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's then and only then that you're born again. We can't compromise that. We need to understand that we live in a time of many, many false prophets. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a remnant brother just a couple of days ago. And he was unaware of the false prophets that had come into the ICOC. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, you know something? I moved out to Kentucky and I thought I was going to go to this new planting where everybody's fired up. And he says, well, the evangelist was kind of fired up, but the people are just as lethargic and lukewarm and sleepy as all the other places that I'd visited. And I said to him, I said, you do understand there's a reason for that. He goes, I, I, what is the reason? I said, let's turn over here to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Now, right here, Paul's speaking. And remember, Paul is the father of faith to the Corinthian church. So he's the dad. <laughs> and he says to them, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you the one husband to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. So Paul says, hey, as the dad who gave birth to my daughter, the church at Corinth, I wanted to present you as a pure virgin bride to your husband, Jesus. And all dads want to do that with their daughters. Verse 3, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than Jesus we preached, or if you receive a spirit other than one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. But do not think that I'm at least in fear of those super apostles. He says, I wanted to present you as a pure virgin. But instead, you were more like Eve. And you got duped by Satan from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He says, when someone came to you preaching a different Jesus, you accepted it easily enough. You know, you can walk into any church and you know the Jesus that's preached or not preached. That's what the church is. It's the body of Christ. So whenever somebody preaches something or does not preach something, it's evident in the fellowship. I said, now, not talking to Remnant Pro, I said, you do understand that. He says, yeah, that's how I feel. I said, but understand this last part. Paul says, well, I don't think I'm inferior to the super apostles. Well, we got to ask ourselves, who are these super apostle guys that preach the different Jesus? We'll go to verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserved. And you know, when, when I read that, there was kind of a gasp on the phone. He understood. You see, these false teachers act as if they're preachers of righteousness, but they're teaching false doctrine. And I said to him, I said, sadly, the ICOC teaches autonomy. Autonomy is a sin. God believes in a central leadership. They teach that discipling is optional and don't even practice it in much, many churches. Why? Because they think, well, there's a point in time you become so mature you don't need discipling. Well, we all know that's not true. We understand discipling is a command of God, Matthew 28. And finally, they went so far as to say in 2002 that the dream to evangelize the nations this generation is impossible. And let, let's get this on straight. The ICOC never evangelized the nations, and that's why they said it was impossible. Now, we as God's sold out movement still believe in the evangelization of the nations in this generation because it's a command of God to go to all nations. Because it's God's will that all men be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, I want to say this. In phase two of the Crown of Thorns project, we want to put a discipling church in every nation of the world. And that's still a great plan. We're going to hold to it. But I say to you this and understand it. The world will be evangelized in a biblical sense, like Paul said in Colossians 1, verse 23, where everyone had heard, not when all the nations have a sold out ministry, way before that, it's when all the nations have heard. All we need 
is three bad attitude articles on BBC, um, CNN, USA Today, and everyone will have heard. But then we still have a lot of work to do, right, church? Well, I understand, as I talked to this remnant brother, that my leadership in the ICOC fell short. In time, I drifted from my joy being and being a disciple from my identity being a leader. And so when my leadership got taken away, I was depressed. I didn't see that I'd lost my first love. I had to repent. I saw that my life was smashed. And I started thinking, what does God smash? Oh, he smashes idols. I'd allowed people to idolize me. And then perhaps worst of all, I had very little mercy upon the weak brothers and sisters in the church. So what did God do? The Laban principle, just like he put Jacob under Laban. Jacob was a deceiver, but Laban was a worse deceiver. God made me weak, a weak disciple. And he put me under, at least in my opinion, men and women that were even more merciless than me. And I understood God. I will never do that again. And yet with my failings, I still believed in the five core convictions that God used to build the ICOC and the same five core convictions that God is using now to build the ICC, the sold out movement. And yet in the midst of all that, I, I want to extend my arms. I want to show mercy. I, I beg all of my brothers and sisters in the ICOC, come and join us in God's sold out movement. Nothing's going to be held against you as long as you go back to your first love. You know, I'll never forget Victor and Sonia Gonzalez coming to Portland in 2004, just a few months after Elaine and I arrived. It was such a joy to have someone that was in the full-time ministry move all the way to Portland from Missouri to join God's movement. I remember the Klopex coming in 2005 and forming the first sold out remnant group in Phoenix, Arizona, because they took their stand against lukewarmness. I remember in 2008, the Rajans contacted me from India, and I knew Rajan Debs from KNN in the 90s. And when they, when they wanted to be a part of the movement, I was so inspired. In 2010, my heart was so refreshed when Corey Blackwell walked through the door in October 2010 with his daughter Avery, and he saw the kingdom again. And after studying for about four weeks, he was restored to the Lord. And I, I, I love Corey with all of my heart. So proud of him and G down there in San Diego now. I remember Blaze giving me a call in 2011 from outside Paris. I said, brother, come join us. In 2012, Gina De La Pena became a one woman remnant group in Manila, Philippines. And now in the Philippines, they're closing in on 500 disciples. And then in 2017, my heart was so warm when John Causey called me in January of that year, saying, bro, I, we've just not talked in 14 years. Can we talk? Well, not only did we talk, we studied the Bible. We cried together. It was so great to be reunited. Now, John had been an enemy of the new movement. But our arms were open wide because through his sabbatical, he had come to see the truth of these five, four core convictions. And just four months later, John and Emma joined us in the new movement. And of course, now they're doing amazing things in Chicago. You know, that doesn't even count the R.D. Bakers, Balazi and Chenariak in Fenway in Lagos, or the Sorotkins that are in um, Kiev. I mean, all these disciples have come. They've come back to Jesus. They've come back to their first love. They've come back to the doctrine that actually gave them salvation. Please, remnant, come and join us. I beg not only the ICSC remnant, but the mainline Church of Christ remnant. I still remember back in 2013, Alexis Turco contacted me from the island of Haiti saying, bro, I want to join the movement. I see all the baptisms. I want to be a part of that. Well, he came on out to the Global Leadership Conference. He studied the Bible for four days straight with all of our French-speaking evangelists. And he saw that he'd never been baptized as a disciple, even though he was a preacher. He was baptized. He went back to Haiti with Blaise. Blaise has been back five different times. 
we now have, through that one remnant disciple who was a preacher in the Church of Christ, we now have over 400 disciples in Haiti and 10 churches of sold out disciples. You know, this past May, I turned 66 years old. <laughs> and I have to admit, I, I thought 66 was kind of a gloomy number. I mean, after all, the only thing I could think of in the Bible was the mark of the beast, 666. But I got a birthday card from one of my daughters in the faith. Her name's Karen Gregory. And she says, bro, happy birthday. When I think of 66, I think that there are 66 books in the Bible. I go, amen. <laughs> but more than that, I think of the fact that you have now lived twice as long as Jesus when he died at 33. That just hit me. I go, oh my gosh. I started to tear up. God had extended me so much grace. You know, 66 was a gloomy number, but I repented. Because I understand that I can't look back at the 70s, 80s, and 90s as my glory days. Matter of fact, that's what Bruce Springsteen sang about. And when you talk to remnant disciples, they say, well, this happened to me in the 90s. I baptized these people. And I saw the church grow like this. Let me tell you something. For Elena and myself, the glory days aren't the 90s. The glory days are now. God is moving in so many unprecedented ways. You know, as I shared about, my other hero was John F. Kennedy, 35th president of the United States. And on September 25th in 1961, he addressed the UN General Assembly on the issue of the proliferation of nuclear warheads. And of course, he was scared about the salvation of the earth. And these are the words he said. He started out with ladies and gentlemen, but I want to paraphrase it a bit and just say, brothers and sisters, the decision is ours. Never have the nations of the world had so much to lose or so much to gain. Together, we shall save our planet, or together, we shall perish in its flames. Save it we can, and save it we must. And then shall we earn the eternal thanks of mankind, and as peacemakers, the eternal blessings of God. The pandemic, it's a dark hour. But let's remember, where it's darkest, the light shines brightest. Thank you. And God bless. Amen, family. Well, that was an incredible lesson by our leader, Dr. Kit McKean. Thank you so much, bro. Uh, I'm going to let Leanne share what she got out of it, and then I'm going to share a few things. Well, thanks so much, Kip, uh, just for sharing with us the history of the movement. Uh, I'm so grateful for the kingdom. I'm so grateful for what we have. And, and truly, it's a gift to be part of this church, uh, but just part of a, a, a group of churches, a group of disciples who want to change the world. And so I'm just grateful for you reminding us of that tonight. Uh, sisters, I hope you took copious notes. I hope that you are coming out of this ready to make a lot of decisions. I know I am, but again, I'm just so grateful for tonight. Thank you so much, Kip. I love you so much. Amen. Well, you know, I think that uh, the biggest thing tonight for me was the call to go back to our first love. I, I really believe that pleases God in an incredible way. And when we please God, when we go back to our first love, we get everything else right. And uh, this is a huge challenge for us. Uh, what a, what a uh, defining moment. I pray that uh, as Leanne said, that everybody doesn't just walk away from here tonight, but really uh, takes the time to make decisions based on what is preached. Uh, we're gonna close out here in a moment with a word of prayer, but it's just so great to have the whole family together here, uh, uh, together in a virtual world missions uh, jubilee. I know that uh, God is so happy to see his family around the world united. Let's close out with a prayer. 
Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for this incredible, incredible evening. Uh, even though it's virtual, God, I know that you are so pleased uh, to have the whole family here together. This is your kingdom, God. Um, thank you so much for Kip and Elena and their leadership. Thank you so much for Kip's lesson. And I just pray, God, that we can take it all to heart and uh, remember it and not let any words drop to the ground and really make decisions tonight that, that please you. Give us the strength to do this, God. We can't do it without you. We love you very much. We pray this in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.